It's been a couple months since I did this. Let me pull up this. Pull up this. Listen really quick. Come on. Hmm. Interesting. Come on. Oh, here we go. I think it just caught up with me. Ah. Oh, here we go. Yes. Come on, keep talking. Why am I watching myself not talk? Because I'm not talking. Yes. Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to go to the dashboard real quick. Set up the thingy here. And just start reading. We got the Pool of Fire, John Christopher. It looks, oh man, I left off in the middle of a chapter. Okay, uh, I can track that. I'm going to have to track down all my files from the last time I recorded, which was over six months ago, according to kind of everything. All right. Um, yes, we talked about flying fish. I'm going to do this last little paragraph the freedom bubbles page 214 all right track again and in any case the masters were not beaten yet not by a long way the last stage of our voyage took us through warmer seas we were headed farther south than on henry's first voyage our landfall being close to the secondary base that had been set up in the mountains, some hundred miles east of the city. It is an odd thing that, although the two continents of the Americas lie north and south of each other, the narrow isthmus that joins them runs east-west. The primary base, from which the flying machines had been launched, had been abandoned after the failure of the attack. We had steady winds behind us from the northeast, and I was told that these blew almost without changing throughout the year. Almost, okay. We had steady winds behind us from the northeast, and I was told, I'm going to just start it over, because that's really short. The last stage of our voyage took us through warmer seas. We were headed farther south than on Henry's first voyage, our landfall being close to the secondary base that had been set up in the mountains some hundred miles east of the city. It is an odd thing that, although th the two continents of the Americas lie north and south of each other, the narrow isthmus that joins them runs east-west. The primary base, from which the flying machines had been launched, had been abandoned after the first failure of the attack. We had steady winds behind us from the northeast, and I was told that these blew almost without changing throughout the year. Once we had come under their influence, they propelled us powerfully. The sea was full of islands, of all shapes and sizes, some tiny and some so enormous that if the sailors had not kept me better informed, I would have taken them for the continent itself. We sailed quite close to many, and there were tantalizing glimpses of lush green hills, golden sands, feathery fronds of trees waving in a breeze. Only the very big ones, it seemed, were inhabited. It would be, wonder if, it would be wonderful to land and explore them. Perhaps when this was all over, Henry could do his preaching for peace on his own, I decided. I would not have been much use to him anyway. We landed at last and went ashore to feel the unfamiliar solidity of firm ground beneath our feet, and to realize that we were back in the shadow of the enemy. This took place at dusk, and we unloaded and carted our gear that night, and the following day lay up in the cover of a forest. 
The work was difficult and not helped by the fact that we had to endure several torrential downpours. It was rain unlike any I had encountered before, almost as though solid water were sheeting down from the sky. It drenched to the skin within seconds. In the morning, though, the sun beat hotly through the leaves of unfamiliar trees. I ventured out to bask and to dry my clothes in a clearing nearby. We had already climbed some way, and this shelf of land looked a long way east. I could see the coastline with minute offshore islands. Something else also. It was miles away, but clear, pinpointed in a bright tropic light, a tripod. It took us several days to get to our base and another week to complete our preparations. After that, all we had to do was wait. And I had had to wait before, all, and thought I had learned patience. There were many long months of training for the games, and the seemingly endless weeks of enforced idleness in the caves, the days and rivers, the days by the river preparing for our invasion of the city, all these, I thought, had schooled me, but they had not. For this was waiting on an entirely different kind, waiting with no fixed term on a permanent alert. We were dependent not by the mean decisions of men or even the mass. <clears throat> it took us several days to get, okay. Consider this a warm up maybe, I don't know. I want to keep an eye on chat. There's at least two people watching. That's cool. Welcome. Um, all right. Gonna fast. Gonna fast forward, or rather rewind, to our last. The last stage of our voyage took us through warmer seas. We were headed further south than on Henry's first voyage, our landfall being close to the secondary base that had been set up in the mountains some hundred miles east of the city. It is an odd thing that, although the two continents of the Americas lie north and south of each other, the narrow isthmus that joins them runs east-west. The primary base, from which the flying machines had been launched, had been abandoned after the failure of the attack. We had steady winds behind us from the northeast, and I was told that these blew almost without changing throughout the year. Once we had come under their influence, they propelled us powerfully. The seas was full of islands, of all shapes and sizes, some tiny and some so enormous that if the sailors had not kept me better informed, I would have taken them for the continent itself. We sailed quite close to many, and there were tantalizing glimpses of lush green hills, golden sands, feathery fronds of trees waving in the breeze. Only the very big ones, it seemed, were inhabited. It would be wonderful to land and explore them. Perhaps when this was all over, Henry could do his preaching for the peace on his own, I decided. I would not have been much use to him anyway. We landed at last and went ashore to feel the unfamiliar, unfamiliar solidity of firm ground under our feet, and to realize that we were back in the shadow of the enemy. This took place at dusk, and we unloaded and carted our gear that night, and the following day lay up in the cover of a forest. The work was difficult and not helped by the fact that we had to endure several torrential downpours. It was rain unlike any I had ever countered before. As though solid water were sheeting down out of the sky, it drenched to the skin within seconds. In the morning, though, the sun beat hotly through the leaves of the unfamiliar trees. I ventured out to bask and to dry my clothes in a clearing nearby. We had already climbed some way, and this shelf of land almost had looked a long way east. I could see the coastline with minute offshore islands, something else also. It was miles away, but clear, pinpointed in the bright tropic light, a tripod. It took us several days to get to our base and another week to complete our preparations. After that, all we had to do was wait. I had had to wait before. I thought I had learned patience. There had been long months of training for the games, the seemingly endless weeks of enforced idleness in the caves, the days by the river preparing for our invasion of the city. All these, I thought, had schooled me, but they had not. For this was waiting of an entirely different kind, waiting with no fixed term on a permanent alert. 
we were dependent not on any decisions of men or even of the masters, but on the vagaries of a greater force than either, nature. Our planning staff had consulted with those recruiting in our earlier expeditions who had lived here all their lives and knew the country and its weather. We had, ha we had to have a wind which would carry our balloons over the city, a wind that is from the northeast that was in fact the prevailing wind which brought us on the last leg of our voyage and at this time of the year constant unfortunately it normally died out over this very strip of land into the equatorial calm which prevailed to the south and the west we must wait for a moment of greater wind strength if we were not to find ourselves becalmed and even drifting away from our target so we had advanced pr positions set up as near as possible to the city whose duty was to report back by pigeon when the wind was holding strongly enough in that direction until they did we could do nothing but chafe at the delay and chafe we did ours had been the second to last party to arrive but although many had waited longer i found myself one of the least able to accept the situation i flared up at the smallest provocation when one of the others made a joking remark that I was so full of hot air, he doubted I, if I needed a balloon. I sailed into him and we fought furiously until we were dragged apart. That evening, Fritz spoke to me. We were in a tent which was leaking in several places. The rain of this land was not easily stopped by canvas. It swished down relentlessly as he remonstrated me. I said I was sorry, but he was not impressed. You have been sorry before, he told me, but you... You keep on doing things without thinking, flying off the handle. We cannot afford dissension here. We must live together and work together. I know, I said, I will do better. He stared at me. He was fond of me, I knew, as I of him. We had been together a long time and shared hardships and dangers. Nevertheless, his expression was grim. He said, as you know, I am in charge of the attack. Julius and I discussed many things before we left. He told me that if I was not sure of any man, I must leave him out of the assault. He spoke of you, Will, in particular. He liked me, but duty came first, as it always would with Fritz. I pleaded him. I pleaded with him for a last chance. In the end, shaking his head, he said he would, but it really was a last chance. If any trouble occurred in which I was concerned, he would not bother to find out who was responsible. Out I would go. The following morning, in the course of our usual drill on the balloons, the one I had fought with tripped me, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, and I went sprawling. Not only did my elbow hit a chunk of rock, but I landed in a patch of sticky mud. I closed my eyes. I lay there for at least five seconds before getting up, with a smile on my face and my teeth tightly gritted. Two mornings later, through yet another downpour, a bedraggled pigeon alighted on a perch in front of its box. A little scroll of paper was fastened to its leg. We had twelve balloons altogether in our force, with one man to each so as to carry the greatest possible weight of explosive. This was sealed inside metal containers, something like the grooved metal eggs we had found in the ruins of the great city, but very much larger. It was not too easy a task to lift them over the edge of the basket. They were fitted with fuses, which would cause them to explode four seconds after the release was pulled. This meant, Beanpole had explained to us, that we needed to make our drop from a height of just under 150 feet. The calculation depended on something which had been discovered by a famous scientist of the ancient called Newtons. He tried to explain it, but it was beyond our comprehension, beyond mine anyway. What it meant was that an object falling through the air traveled a distance in, a feet, in feet of 16 multiplied twice over by the number of seconds it had been falling Thus, in the second it would fall 16 feet, 16 multiplied by 1, multiplied by 1. In 2 seconds, 64 feet, and in the 3, and 144, and the 4th second was the time allowed for getting the bomb, as he called it, into position and ready for the drop. We had practiced with dummy bombs over and over again, learning to calculate distances from the ground, to estimate them, and so on. There was also the question of the forward motion of the balloon, which naturally affected the place at which the bomb dropped. We had become reasonably skilled in the art. Now we had to apply it. I'm going to start that one over just because I read it like I didn't understand it. 
Hey Addison, add Z, add Z008. All right, rewind to this. You're doing seven minutes, okay. We had 12 balloons all together in our force, with one man to each, so as to carry the great... Okay. We had 12 balloons all together in our force, with one man each, so as to carry the greatest possible weight of explosive. This was sealed inside metal containers, something like the grooved metal eggs we had found in the ruins of the great city, but very much larger. It was not too easy a task to lift them over the edge of the basket. They were fitted with fuses, which would cause them to explode four seconds after the release was pulled. This meant, Bean Pole had explained to us, that we needed to make our drop from a height of just under 150 feet. The calculation depended on something which had been discovered by a famous scientist of the ancients called Newton. He tried to explain it, but it was beyond our comprehension, beyond mine anyway. But what it meant was that an object falling through the air traveled at a distance in feet of 16, multiplied twice over by the number of seconds it had been falling. Thus, in the first second, it would fall 16 feet, that being 16 by 1 by 1, in 2 seconds, 64 feet, and in 3, 144. The fourth second was the time allowed for getting the bomb, as he called it, into position and ready for the drop. We had practiced with dummy bombs over and over again, learning to calculate distances from the ground, to estimate time, and so on. There was also the question of the forward motion of the balloon, which naturally affected the place at which the bomb dropped. We had become reasonably skilled in the art. Now we had to apply it. The balloons went up at two second intervals into a sodden gray sky, and a wind dragged in from the ocean behind us. Our order had been allocated by Fritz, who went first. I was sixth. Henry was tenth. As I cast off, I found myself shooting skyward. I looked down at the faces so quickly dwindling below. I saw Beanpole looking up, his spectacles almost certainly obscured by rain. It was hard luck on Beanpole, I thought, but the thought of was fleeting. I was more concerned with having made it myself, with being freed of the delays and irritations. The lashing rain had already soaked me, but that was unimportant. We soared higher, and in a long line that still preserved some irregularity. The country on which I looked down was a strange one, made up of low pointed hills, rounded in all sorts of different shapes, and covered by a dense forest that stretched away, almost to reach the gray line that marked the ocean. The rain drove steadily into the driving wind, valleys unfolded again behind me. Gradually the hills flattened and the forests gave way to fields of crops. There were occasional small villages of whitewashed houses. A river appeared, and for a time our course followed it. The line was breaking up, spreading out, affecting, affected in small inconsistencies in the wind. Some balloons were making better progress than others. I was chagrined to find that my own was falling behind. We were in two main groups, nine in advance, three of us forming the rear guard. Henry was one of those three. I waved to him, and he waved back. We lost the river, but found this or another not long after. It was the, if it was the same one, it had widened. Later it flowed into a lake, a long neck of water stretching far at least for at least ten miles. Later it flowed into a lake, a long neck of water stretching for at least ten miles on our right. <coughs> we lost the river, but found this or another lo not long after. <coughs> Hang on. I'm losing my voice here. Check something real fast. All right, cool. <laughs> Starting over at the river portion. We lost the river, but found this or another not long after. If it was the same one, it had widened. Later on it flowed into a lake, a long neck of water stretching for at least ten miles on our right. The land beneath us was barren and lifeless, with a scorched blackened look. This would be part of the zone around the city which the masters had laid waste as a defensive measure. I looked ahead more keenly, but saw nothing but water on one side, and burnt, empty land rising on the other. 
The advanced balloons were increasing their lead over the rest. It was infuriating, but there was nothing to be done about it. In fact, we were all traveling more slowly because the rain had died out and the wind had dropped. Our course had been carefully calculated, but I wondered if the calculation might not be off or the wind changed direction so that we would drift aimlessly out to sea. Ahead, the lake dogleg to the right, but at that point, it ran south of west, almost straight, absolutely regular, a ditch that the ancients had made to take their ships across the isthmus from one ocean to the other. There were no ships in it, but it was something else straddling it, a giant green-shelled golden beetle. The calculation had not been wrong. Right ahead of us lay the third city of the masters. I did not have much time for contemplation. My attention was taken up by something else which appeared from high from behind high ground to the left of the city. Presumably the tripod was returning in the ordinary way to its base, but catching sight of the cluster of bubbles bobbing through the air, it checked and changed course. It got to them when the first balloon was in a hundred yards of the wall. A flailing tentacle came close but missed as the balloonist jettisoning ballast sent his craft soaring. The others were approaching the tripod too. The tentacle flailed again, this time struck home. The balloon crumpled and dropped to the dark, wet ground below. The tripod was like a man swatting insects. Two more balloons in the advanced group went down. The others got past. The first was over the city. Something fell from it. I counted one, two, three. Nothing happened. The bomb had failed to explode. Two other balloons were off target, far to the left. But the remaining three would cross over the expanse of green crystal. Another bomb dropped. One more time I counted. There was a great thump of sound as it went off, but the dome, as far as I could see, was still in inviolate. Two other I'm gonna start over on this. Two other balloons were off target, to the left, but the remaining three would cross over the expanse of green crystal. Another bomb dropped. Once more I counted. There was a great thump of sound as it went off, but the dome, as far as I could see, was still inviolate. I could not watch what was happening ahead after that. The tripod stood directly in my path. Everyone so far had dropped ballast to rise and dodge the enemy blows. I guessed he would be getting used... Oh, man. Poor baby. Just broke my brain. Ah, I'll wait for Diego. He's making funny noises. Okay, so the tripod stood directly in my path. All right. Everyone so far had dropped ballast to rise and dodge the enemy blows. I guessed he would be getting out of the way. No. Everyone so far had dropped ballast and to rise and dodge the enemy's blows. I guessed he would be getting used to the maneuver, waiting until the tentacle was moving to its strike. I pulled the release cord and, with a sickening crunch, felt my balloon drop. The tentacle passed overhead. I had no idea by how much, for my attention was on the ground toward which I was falling. Hastily, I threw out sandbags and the balloon shot up. The tripod was behind me, the city ahead. I glanced back. I saw one of the balloons struck down, the other coming on. I hoped it was Henry, but I could not look to find out. I had heard two more explosions, but the city's dome still stood intact. My balloon was over it, and looking down, I could dimly see through its translucent green the clustered peaks of the pyramids inside. My, heart, my height was about right, though more by luck than anyone else, after the evading action I had been forced to take. Reaching down, I pulled out the fuse pin and heaved the bomb up over the basket's edge, poised it for an instant, and let go. The balloon lifted with the release of weight. I counted the seconds. Just before three, the bomb hit, skidded, bounced off from the curve of the dome, and went off, and the blast of air rocked me violently. With dismay, I saw that there was no sign of break in the crystal. That left just one balloon, one single hope. It was Henry. I knew by the color of the shirt he was wearing. He was going in dead over the city, but not keeping to the height that Beanpole and the scientists had prescribed. I watched him dropping, dropping. 
the basket scraped the surface of the dome. Then I understood what he was about. He had seen the failure of those in front of us and understood the reason for it. The scientists had told us that the bombs were powerful enough to shatter the crystal having experimented on the broken dome of the city we had taken. But of course, the bombs had to be touching or very close to the crystal when the explosion took place. Our bombs had ricocheted sufficiently to be outside those limits. The odds were against his being any more successful, at least as far as dropping it was concerned. But planting was another matter. My own transit had been toward the city, with a roof of falling curve beneath me. Okay, starting over. But planting was another matter. My own transit had been toward the edge, with a roof of a falling curve beneath me. Henry's course had taken him across the center. The dome flattened there, and a man could walk on it. My mind was a confusion of hope and horror. The basket scraped again, bounced up, dropped. I saw the distant figure struggle to lift something. As I watched, he scrambled over the edge of the basket. The balloon released, rose sharply into the sullen gray sky. Henry stayed there, crouching, ant-like against the gleaming surface that stretched all around, crouching and cradling something in his arms. I turned away. Not until some seconds after the explosion did I have the heart to look back. The master's air billowed up like green smoke from the ragged hole, which, as I looked, crumbled still further at the edges. Almost blindly, I pulled the cord and let my balloon drop toward the waiting earth. Chapter 9. The Conference of Man. <clears throat> Chapter 9. The Conference of Man. Once before, three of us had gone up through the tunnel that wound inside the mountains to the field of eternal snow and ice at the top. We had walked then, resting when we were tired, lighting our way with the big, slow-burning tallow candles which were used to illuminate the lower caves in which we lived. Not the same three, Fritz now took the place that had been Henry's. And not in the same way, either. Instead of walking, we sat at ease in one of four carriages pulled by a small but powerful diesel-electric train up the cog track. Instead of the dim flicker of candlelight, we were in a bright and even radiant. Instead of the dim flicker of candlelight, we were in a bright and even radiance in which one could read a book if one had a mind. We did not carry rations, though stringy dried meat. We did not carry rations, tough stringy dried meat and hard tasteless biscuits, because food was to be provided at our journey's end, where a skilled staff of 50 waited, more than 11,000 feet above sea level, to look after the delegates and those fortunate enough to have been invited to attend the Conference of Man. It was Julius's wish that there that it should be held there. Make sure he's okay. Okay. It was Julius's wish that it should be held here, high up in the peaks of the White Mountains, that had sheltered the early seeds of man's resistance to his conquerors. It was by Julius's order that we, along with the other survivors of the days of battle, had come. We were not delegates, though probably we could have been with if we had so desired. I am not boasting in saying that. It was just that those of us who had fought against the masters and defeated them could claim privileges anywhere, and had so wearied of adulation that we had preferred to look for quietness and privacy. The three of us had looked in different directions. Beanpole was immersed in research in the vast laboratories that had been built in France, not far from the castle by the sea. Fritz had turned farmer in his own native land and spent his days with his crops and beasts, while I, more restless and perhaps more less purposeful than any, had sought contentment in exploring those parts of the world which the masters had stripped of their previous human inhabitants. In a ship with half a dozen others, I crossed the seas and put into strange forgotten harbors on unknown coasts. Under sail because, although there were ships in with engines now, we preferred it that way. This had been our first meeting in two years, we had laughed and talked a lot when we met in the town that lay between the two lakes down in the valley, but the talk had dried up during the long journey inside the mountain. We were engaged with our own thoughts. Mine were somewhat melancholy. 
I was remembering the things we had done together, the times we had had. It would be pleasant to preserve that comradeship in the days that came after. Pleasant, but alas, impossible. That which had brought us together had gone, and now our paths diverged, according to our natures and our needs. We would meet again from time to time, but always a little more as strangers, until perhaps at last, as old men with only memories left, we could sit together and try to share them. Because the victory, everything had changed. Because with victory, everything had changed. There had been the months of anxious waiting for the arrival of the great ship of the masters, but even during the time that the world had been picking itself up and relearning forgotten skills and compressing the months, what had it taken our forefathers decades and centuries to accomplish? Only when one autumn night a new star winked in the sky did people pause to draw breath and stare anxiously into the heavens. It was a star that moved, a point of light traveling past the fixed familiar ones. In powerful telescopes it resolved into a shape, a metal cocoon. Scientists made calculations of its size and the result was breathtaking. More than a mile long, they said, and a quarter of a mile wide at, at its thickest part. It swung into an orbit around the Earth and we waited tense to see what it would do. They had won before by guile, and the trick would not work twice. The air of our planet was poison to them, and they had no base to shelter. Men still wore caps, but the caps would give no orders. They could try to set up fresh bases, and might succeed, but we would harry them continually with weapons that were more and more sophisticated every year. Having beaten them when they were all-powerful and we pitifully weak, we knew we would could better any effort they made in the future. Alternatively, they could cast down death and destruction from their secure haven in the skies. This was a possibility to which many inclined, and which I myself thought most likely, at the beginning at least. They might hope that after a long enough time of this that we would be so weakened, our spirits so shattered, that they could descend and hope to rule our battered planet. That would be a longer struggle, and a crueler one, but we would win in the end for that too. They did neither. They merely set down three bombs, and each landed on its target and destroyed it utterly. The targets were the dead cities of their colonists. We lost the men who were working in them at the time, including many scientists, but it was a loss of a few hundred when it might have been millions. And when the third bomb had exploded, the light in the sky suddenly dwindled and disappeared. And that instant, it did so, Ruki, the last of the masters, left alive on earth, stirred in his prison cell, a new one, well appointed, with a high ceiling and a garden pool and a plate glass front, through which men could watch him like a beast in a zoo. He howled once, crumpled, and died. The train chugged through the last of the inter intermediate stations, and the wall of the tunnel closed in around us again. I said, why did they give in so easily? I have never understood. Fritz looked puzzled, but Beanpole said, I don't think anyone knows. I read a new book about them recently, by a man who was studying Rookie during these final months. They know a lot about the way their bodies work, from dissections, but their minds are still largely a mystery. They resign themselves to fate, how, somehow, in a way that men do not. Those in the tripods died when their cities died. Ruki gave up the ghost when he realized, in some strange way, that the ship had abandoned him and turned back into the depths of space. I do not think we shall ever know how it happens. Perhaps we shall meet them again, I said. How are the plans for the rockets to the moon progressing? There go well, Beanpole said, and so is the work on the flame energy they used. It is a form of atomic power, but much more subtle than the ones the scientists of the ancients developed. We shall be out among the stars within a hundred years, perhaps even fifty. Not I, I said cheerfully. I shall stick to my tropic seas. Fritz said, if we do meet again out there, it will be their turn to fear us. The conference hall had high windows along one side, through which one looked out onto a dozen or more small peaks, white with snow, and onto the great river of imperceptibly moving ice, which ran for thirty miles among them. The sun stood in the cloudless sky above it all. Everything was sharp and dazzling, and so bright that one needed dark glasses to look out for more than a moment or two. In the hall, the, the council, with Julius presiding, sat at the table at one end, on a dais only slightly raised from the level of the rest of the floor. 
most of the rest of the space was taken up by the delegate seats. At the far end, behind a silken rope barrier, was the area for the rest, those like ourselves, who had come to the council's special invitation, certain officials and representatives of the newspaper and the radio stations. In a year or two, we had been promised that there would be something called television by which men could see in their own homes things happening half a world away. It was a device which the masters had used as a preliminary stage in their conquest to hypnotize men and so control their minds, and our scientists were making sure it could not happen again before they reintroduced it. The room, although large and high ceiling, was very crowded. We had seats at the front and so looked directly onto the benches of the delegates which were arranged in concentric circles around a small central space. Each section had the sign of the country from which they came. I saw the sign of my own England, the signs of France, Germany, Italy, Russia, the United States of America, China, Egypt, Turkey, one could not take them all in. From a door at the other end, the members of the council began to file in and take their places. We rose as they did so. Julius came last, leaning heavily on his stick, and applause swelled across the room. When it died at last, the secretary of the council, a man called Umberto, spoke. He was brief. He announced the opening of the Conference of Man and called on the president of the council to speak. There was more applause, which Julius checked with the gesture of his hand. It was two years since I had last seen him. He did not seem to have changed much. A little more bent, perhaps, but there was vigor in his stance and his voice was strong. He wasted no time on the talk of the past. What concerned him was the present and the future. Our scientists and technologists were rapidly reacquiring the knowledge and skills of our ancestors and improving upon them. The promise of all this was inestimable, but the glorious future which man could and should enjoy depended on the way in which he governed himself, for man was a measure of all things. A glorious future. It was right, I thought, for Julius to speak in that strain, because there was no doubt that in doing so he spoke of the overwhelming majority of the peoples of the world. They had an insatiable appetite for the toys and wonders of the past. Everyone went in and so called everyone went in so called civilized lands, everyone heard radio and there was a great impatience for television. I had visited my parents on the way here, and had heard my father talk about installing electricity at the mill. In Winchester, new buildings had been started to store, soar within... <sighs> wow. In Winchester, new buildings had started to soar within a stone's throw of the cathedral. It was what most people wanted, but I did not. I thought of the world in which I was born, Okay. It was what most people wanted, but I did not. I thought of the world into which I had been born, in which I had grown up. The world of villages and small towns, of a peaceful, ordered life, untroubled, unhurried, taking its pattern from the seasons. I thought, too, of my stay at the Chateau de la Tour Rouge, of the Comte and the Comtesse, of the days riding and sitting idly in the sun, of summer meadows, trout-filled streams, of the squires talking and laughing together, the knights jousting in the tournament, of Eloise, her face small and calm and lovely under the blue turban, was as clear as though it were only yesterday that I had woken from my fever and seen her down, looking down at me. No, the fine new world that was being built held few attractions for me. Fortunately, I could turn my back on it and find my way through the quiet seas into faraway harbors. Julius was continuing to talk about government, this was the crucial thing, and all else flowed from it. The council had been formed in the days when a handful of men hid in caves and plotted the recovery of the world's freedom. That freedom had been achieved, and the local governments had arisen, all over the world, each administering its own territory. But internal affairs, the control of science, and so on, came under the jurisdiction of the council. It was clear in the interests of everyone that some such system should continue, but it was also essential that it should be subject to the democratic control of the people of the world. For this reason, the council was prepared to dissolve itself and hand over its authority and functions to a similar, though possibly larger body, which would properly represent everyone. That would require study and organization, and there would be a further transitional period for this. 
The conference should be decided the length. The conference should decide the length of time required. The conference should also appoint the new provisional council to take the place of the present one. I think that is all I need to say, Julius said. All that remains is for me to thank you all for your cooperation to in this in the past and to wish good fortune on the new council and the new president. He sat down to a renewed outbreak of applause. It was loud and enthusiastic, but surprisingly patchy. There were even some with that sat who, with folded nothing. He sat down to a renewed outbreak of applause. It was loud and enthusiastic, but surprisingly patchy. There were even some who sat with folded hands. As it died away, someone rose, and the secretary, who was acting as speaker, said, I call on the senior delegate from Italy. He was a short, swarthy man, with hair growing in a scanty halo around the mesh of the cap. He said, I propose, before anything else, the re-election of Julius as president of the new council. There were cheers, but not from all the delegates. The senior German delegate said, I second that notion. The senior German delegate said, I second that motion. There were cries of vote, but the others of denial. In the confusion, someone else rose. I recognized him, too, as a man I had remembered. It was Pierre who had spoken against Julius those six long years ago in the caves. He was the delegate from France. He began to speak calmly, but there was a hint of something else, not far beneath the calm. He first of all attacked the procedure that was being suggested of appointing a new president first. This should follow the formation of the new council, not precede it. He went on to speak against the suggestion that there should be a further transitional period. There was no need for this. The conference had the power to create a fully effective and permanent council, and should do so. We had wasted enough time already. He paused, and then, looking directly at Julius, went on. It is not only a matter of wasting time, gentlemen. This conference has been brought here to be used. It was known in advance that certain delegates would propose the reappointment of Julius as president. We are expected, out of sentiment, to vote him back into office. We are asked to confirm a despot in power. Shouting an uproar followed. Pierre waited until it had quieted and said, In times of crisis it may be necessary to accept the rule of a dictator, but the crisis is over. The world we create must be a democratic world, and we ourselves cannot give way to sentiment. We are sent here to represent the people to serve their interests. The Italian delegate called, Julius saved us all. No, Pierre said, that is not true. There were others who worked and fought for freedom, hundreds, thousands of others. We accepted Julius as our leader, but there is no reason to accept him now. Look at this conference. The council has taken long enough to summon it. The authority they have been given until such a time as the masters were de defeated. That happened nearly three years ago, but only now, reluctantly, there was a new disturbance out of the German... There was a new disturbance out of which the German delegate could be heard saying, It was not just possible before. There has been much readjustment, Pierre cut through his words. And why here? There are dozens, a hundred places in the world better suited to hold a conference such as this. We are here because of the whim of an aging tyrant. Yes, I insist, Julius wanted the conference here, among the peaks of the White Mountains, as another means of reminding us of the debt we are supposed to owe him. Many delegates are from the lowlands and find conditions here oppressive. Several have been ill with mountain sickness and have been forced to go down to lower levels. This does not bother Julius. He has brought us to the White Mountains, thinking that we will here not dare vote against him. But if men care for their freedom, he will find he is wrong. Shouts and countershouts echoed all across the hall. One of the American delegates made a speech in Julius' support. So did the Chinese delegate, but others followed Pierre's line. A delegate from India declared that personalities were unimportant. What mattered was the building up of strong and vigorous government, and that required a strong and vigorous leader, and one not enfeebled by age. Julius had done great things and would be long remembered, but his place should be taken by a younger man. Fritz beside me said, they will vote him out. They can't, I said. It's unthinkable. A few are yapping, but when it comes to a vote... The debate dragged on. The vote came at last, the motion to reappoint Julius as president. They had rigged up an electronic they had they had rigged up an electrical device by which delegates pressed buttons marked for or against. 
and the results were recorded on a screen set up in the rear wall. The figures lit up. Four. 152. I held my breath. Against. 164. The storm that followed of cheers and shouts of indignation was more violent than any of the previous ones. It did not end until it could be seen that Julius was on his feet. He said, the conference has been made. He said, the conference has made its decision. He looked no different, but his voice was suddenly tired. We must all accept it. I only ask that we remain united under whatever president and council are appointed. Men do not count. Unity does. The applause this time was scattered. The senior delegate from the United States said, We came here, in good faith, prepared to work with men of all nations. We have heard petty bickering, abuse of a great man. The history books told us that this was what Europeans were like, that they could never change, but we did not believe them. Well, we believe them now. This delegation hereby withdraws this farce of a conference. This delegation hereby withdraws from this farce of a conference. We have a continent of our own. We can look after ourselves. They picked up their things and headed for the door. But before they got there, a Chinese delegate in his soft, lilting voice said, We agree with the American delegation. We do not feel our interests will be served by a council dominated by the passions which have been shown today. Regretfully, we must depart. One of the German delegates said, This is the work of the French. They are concerned only with their own interests and ambitions. They wish to dominate Europe as they dominated it in the past. But I would say to them, beware. We Germans have an army which, we will, which will defend our frontiers, an air force. His remarks were lost in pandemonium. I saw English delegates get up and leave, following those who had already left. I looked at Julius. His head was bowed. His hands were covering his eyes. From the conference building, you could walk out over hard-packed snow, up the slope to the jungle frau. Frau Jach. Whoa. Jung Frau Jach? How do I say that? Oh boy. Time for research. Um, I've only had to do this like five times in the past, and it's always kind of fun. Jung Frau Jach? I don't know. Google. Google Translate. We're going from, I think, German to English. Young Frau Jung Frau that's easier than I thought it was. Young Frau Jach. Young Frau Jach. Ah, that's close. Okay, starting over from this paragraph. Uh, I'm going to track it in the middle of this chapter. From the conference building, you could walk out over hard packed snow up the slope to the Young Frau Jach itself. The Young Frau glistened on our left, and the Monarch and the Eiger on our right. There was the rounded dome of the observatory, once more in use to study the distant passionless heavens. Below us, snowfields plunged away and one could see down into the green valley. The sun was setting and it was in shadow. We had been silent since we came up from the hall. Now Beanpole said, if Henry not had not died, I said, we would have one man. No. I said, would one man have made any difference? One might, Julius did. And it could have been more than one. I would have helped him if he had wanted me to. I thought about that. I said, perhaps I would also, but Henry is dead. Fritz said, I think perhaps I will give up my farming. There are things more important. Beanpole replied, I'm with you. Fritz shook his head. It's different for you. Your work is more important. Mine is not. Not as important as this, Beanpole said. What about you, Will? Are you ready for a new fight? A longer, less exciting one with no great triumphs at the end? Will you leave your seas and islands and help us try to get the men to live together in peace as well as liberty? 
an Englishman, a German, and a Frenchman, it would be a good start. The air was cold but exhilarating. A gust of wind scattered powdery snow from the face of the Jungfrau. Yes, I said, I'll leave my seas and islands. The end. Stop. Howdy, Saint. Saint Just. I hope I said all that right. I didn't inadvertently offend anybody, including Saint Just here. <laughs> no, 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 I meant, did I say Jungfrau? What is that? Jungfrau, y'all. I don't even know what that is. It sounds like a mountain and two rivers by my but anyway yeah Google translate okay Jungfrau is virgin that's interesting I've n never heard that word in all of this trilogy that I've spent the last okay Virgo yeah Interesting. Cool. Okay, I get it. Yeah. But what is Joch? J O C H. Jungfrau Joch. Like, I, mean, I can't type it anywhere. Sure, what's up? What are you thinking? I'm, I am totally open to more book suggestions. I don't do this kind of thing often, but it's fun. I know one I want to read next is called Dark Universe by Daniel Galuya. That one I have wanted to read for a long time. Ooh, okay. Three sessions reading a book out loud. Yeah, I, this is my second do, doing this particular one. But in a, in addition, I should probably just show up the stupid cover. <laughs> yeah, it's over there. Whatever. Sure. Yeah, you can put the you can put the link in chat. I think you're the only one <laughs> sitting there, so. Oh man, my other computer is taking so long. I'm gonna try booting it again. Interesting, a new religion based on math. Hmm. One sec. <laughs> Crash. I could read this one. Ah. God series, mixed mathematics, science, philosophy, religion, art, lit, myth, TV, movies, sociology, economics, psychology, politics, and history in one monolithic edifice. Man, that's a very broad set of, um, it's a very broad set. Oh. It did block the link. What's it called? Can you just give the, the title and the author? I can look it up myself. I didn't realize. I thought that was a dot, dot, dot. The God Game. Okay. I got it. 
Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's... Oh, wow. There's 32 books in this entire series. Wow. I'm not going to complain. But if I dove into that, that would take a very long time, I think. Hmm. Illuminism. The Pythagorean religion of mathematics that infallibly explains things and guarantees everyone a soul that is not only eternal, but also has the capacity to make each of us a true god. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. I might look into it. I don't know, but it is a thought. But I got to tackle this one first, which my brother-in-law recommended. Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, Grudem, which, oh boy, oh boy, it's been around a while. It goes through everything. In any case, finally finished the Tripod Trilogy, and that makes me extremely happy. Because I've been working on that for probably five years. Hmm. Ah, it's fine. You don't need to donate anything. I'll probably just... That's $5 isn't anything for me. But thank you for the offer. Um, yeah, gold ink. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna bookmark that for now, and I'll look into it a little later. Hmm. Well, quote, yeah, that might just be where I diverge from this book. <laughs> because I think in technicality, I am an Abrahamist. I'll still look into it. I'll glance through it, maybe. We'll see. I'll at least bookmark it and see if I can look into it a little later. Thank you for the offer, though. Yeah, might be kind of fun. But I still do want to do, I still want to do uh, Dark Universe. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes, I am a Christian. Yeah. I haven't ever heard of this one. But I, growing up, I did hear a lot of sermons regarding this exact thing of like religion and religion versus relationship, that kind of thing, and how all of the rules, the rules of um, morality and that kind of thing are different from the actual relationship you have with God, that kind of thing. I don't feel adequate in 
explaining it myself just because it's been a long time since I got into it. But, um, yeah. I can totally understand at least the title of this video. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's a really good one. That that is that is good and powerful right there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to look that one up and <laughs> bookmark that as well. Whoops. Save. <laughs> yep. That's the premise of what I was taught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those that is pretty powerful. And in fact, my thought would be something to the effect of um, I don't know. Is I'm I'm more anecdotal than anything. I can't come up with sayings off the top of my head, but I can come up with anecdotes like watching all these cartoons and things of oh yeah. I show up at the gates of heaven. I've been a good person. I've done all the things. I've not cheated or stolen anything. I should be let in. And it's like, it's not part, that's not the point of it. The point of it is, did you know God? And did God know you? I mean... Yes. Same here. That's a, that's a very good one. Um, I'm looking one up right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. No judgment from, but yeah. <laughs> I just, I guess what I was saying before was based on what is this, uh, Matthew? Of course. Matthew 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Essentially, <laughs> did you know the God? Did you know God, or did you just know the rules that he put into place? Anyway, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thought. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and 
hide that since it's no longer relevant. Okay, I'm gonna have to figure out how the heck to remix all this audio that I've recorded. I'm gonna have to find out where I was at before, about six months ago when I last recorded. Um, throw this back into oh gosh I've misplaced all the things yeah that's a good that's good thinking there yeah I have found that on my own it's just living on my own there is much to be gained by looking outside yourself. I mean, in a more, um, I guess, I don't know, in a more broad scope, looking outside of your own little box you realize that well, there's seven billion other people out there. And I don't know, the, the, we think the world is focused on us, sort of, a, I don't know. And I see a lot of people that treat the world as if it is theirs. But yeah. Hmm. See, yeah, there, there was a another anecdote. <laughs> there was a sort of, um, An analogy my one of my um, school teachers gave me, which was um, existence is a kind of a layered thing. We perceive this reality, but time, space, it's like a bubble or a capsule that God holds and he can look from one end and see time going this way. He can look from the other end and see time going this way. He exists in the infinite. And he made this thing called our existence, which does have a beginning and an end, but the, I don't know, kind of the um, <clears throat> difficult to grasp, difficult to explain, difficult to make sound less weird than it might be explanation of reality is that the afterlife would hopefully lead into the infinite existence. But again, I'm no expert on that at all. In fact, I've got a friend that would do a lot better in because he just reads the heck out of all of this literature. I might ask him about that other um, that other book that you recommended. I might just ask him about that, see what he thinks, because he would tear that thing apart. <laughs> he might tear it apart. He might find correlations, but I don't know. It's yeah. He's one I've wanted to debate. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say outside space time. I would say parallel to it. In a certain, in a sense, it's a different way of thinking. 
I mean, we have kind of taken the last 20 years, maybe even longer, to align the mind with this idea of a Doctor Who type existence where, oh, we can just head into the, whatever, the, the vortex and jump wormhole between two places and two times and, oh, we can also leave it completely. We can float in nothingness, all this just, how does humanity, how do humans invent this sort of thinking is interesting. And I did have a discussion with a group of friends of mine about it. And they thought, is it blasphemous to think this way? I'm like, no, I think it's just interesting creativity. But I happen to believe the spiritual realm is a little closer than we realize. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's a good point. Huh. That is a very good point. It's really sad that that group of mine broke up a couple month, weeks ago. They just, the guy that was in charge of it said, ah, this, I've been doing this for eight years and I am kind of transitioning into a different point in my life where I've got to take care of my spouse. I kind of want to just move on, getting burned out. So unfortunately we don't talk as much now but I should get a hold of my friend on that, on those topics, see what he's got to say. Because it is pretty deep and powerful, and he is way more well-versed than me on that kind of stuff. Anyway, I'm going to head out. I have a couple things I need to do. Thanks for the talk, Saint. Um, hopefully we'll see you in the future.